Whiz Beach Road, the outskirts of Littleport, the fringe really of what is a, a, the edge of a modern Fenland town, from where I stand. And as you can hear, today there's a modern bypass. I can see the garage, and off to my left, on the road off to Wisbeach, several modern industrial units. This area has seen a lot of development. It wasn't always like this. Gaps in the hedgerow, you can see open flat farmland, outbuildings, farm buildings. Very much the way the fens have probably been for hundreds of years. It was against that background in the early 1970s. An event would happen that would affect a young local man for the rest of his life. This is a hot wampa local news special. Hello and welcome to a very special local news special episode of Hot Wampa Podcast. We're fortunate today, BBC Radio Cambridgeshire have had this man, Heart FM have had this man, and now us, your own little East Anglian science fiction podcast, Hot Wampa has this man. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you Mr Tony Buckingham. Hello, good morning. Good morning Tony. Tony is the leader of the East Anglian UFO group. Now this for Tony has been a, a bit of a, a labour of love, a bit of a lifetime of, of research into the uh, UFO phenomenon, hasn't it, Tony? Uh, it has indeed. Well, ever since I was oh, around 17, 18 years old, yeah, it's been uh, it's been at some level all the way through to the present day, yeah. And would it be right to say that that um, that interest was was spurred by an, an experience you had yourself in your in your late teenage years? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in in those days, all I was interested in was uh, rock music, uh, girls, and motorbikes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wasn't into sci-fi or anything like that. And so this was a bit of a shock when I had the experience. And I guess it's changed my life forever. It, it, well, it's clearly had an effect to you, you know, that in the sense that it's drummed up an enthusiasm and, and a hunger for knowledge on the subject of ufology. Um, I know it must be a story that you must have recounted multiple times, but I don't know if maybe you could um, elaborate for our listeners and go through your own encounter. No problem at all. Uh, let's see. It all started uh, around 1971-72. I didn't document it at the time, but uh, I recall when it was within a little. It was in. It all happened in the uh, late evening. I was on my own at my father's bungalow, which was situated uh, in Wisbridge Road in Littleport. And at those days, we had, um, it was not a coal fire, but I think they called it coke or something or other. It was uh, a form of solid fuel uh, that you put in, onto this uh, enclosed boiler, and it kept your central heating running. Um, maybe they still use it, I don't know. But periodically, you have to go out, outside to pick up some more of this fuel and that's what I did I went outside it was a, as I said a, a quite a chilly night a, a crisp evening um, very still um, and at the rear of the property it looked out over the fens I think there was just three visible houses in those days uh, the bypass has been built since then so there's obviously a lot more traffic now and indeed there's some more houses built but uh, in those days, there was there was nothing, so it's pitch dark out the back. Um, the 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 moon was out to my right; it was a silvery colour, and the stars were out. I bent down to uh, put this coal scuttle, I think they used to call it, like a shoot thing. It was mm. uh, put it in the bottom of the, uh, the the where all the fuel was and was ramming the stuff in, and all of a sudden, my my ears are felt as though that you know when sometimes you you're in an airplane and your ears go pop and everything is muted like with uh, a change a, in pressure yep that's exactly yeah. what it sounded uh, uh felt like it, and and i actually re recall pressing my ears to clear my ears and i stood up as i did it but as i stood up i just felt i don't know like a cold sweat and a tingling sensation oh. over my whole body um and as i looked up uh in front of me um, uh, I don't know, slightly uh, higher in the sky anyway, but quite low 
was um, this 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 shape, this object. Um, it was the shape of an old-fashioned Victorian spinning top, or maybe more like a cone. I, yeah. I, you would probably describe it rather than a saucer. It was. I always used to describe it as a, a dirty gold in colour. Um, it appeared to be spinning, but it may not have been. It appeared to have like little. What I assumed was windows at the top, so I was assuming it was a craft of some kind. Um, and it had what I thought was a bobble, uh, like a, some sort of bobble on the top as well. Um, at the time, I felt my my hairs on my body, all over my body, was almost electrified. I could feel this, like the static going through and uh, uh my dog was with me and and the dog sort of ran away so he was obviously sensing something and i just stared at this thing thinking to myself shall i run in and get a camera i mean in those days people didn't have phone cameras on phones it didn't even have mobile phones and i couldn't even remember where the camera was and, and uh, as i was looking at it what seemed like ages but probably was only just a few seconds this thing shot upwards into the sky um at a silly silly speed uh, straight up and then when it became the size of i don't know a very very small it just darted off diagonally when it was in front of me um before it flew off or whatever you'd call it it was about the size of a large egg if you held it out at arm's length um so it was it was quite yeah, well, it seemed quite close, but because I had nothing to reference the size against to scale it with, it's difficult to say. I mean, it could have been the size of an egg, and it was literally at arm's length, or it could have been the size of an aircraft hangar, but miles away. I really don't know. Um, that was pretty much it, really. I told my mother and father when they got back, and they, I think it was out of their frame of reference, really. They didn't know what to say. They just said it was one of those things. <laughs> Mm. Um, and that was basically the sum total of what happened there that, that evening. So despite it being quite a, a clear night, I mean, you've mentioned that you could see the moon and, and mm. the stars. Mm. Because it obviously it was dark, you you couldn't see a uh, horizon or other buildings clearly in the dark. So you really had no way of referencing the actual size and distance. No, no, not really. You could only gauge that sort of outreached. It was around the size of an egg sort of thing at, at the end of arm's length, kind of. Yes, so it yeah. could have been massive and a mile away, or it could have been, like you say, quite small and quite close. You couldn't Absolutely. really gauge the distance or the scale of it. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. What's really weird is uh, I, it started me on this journey that we spoke about all my life researching this stuff, and I'd never seen uh, anywhere this same shape. And it's mm -hmm. always left me a little bit perplexed that you see all these shapes, and I've never actually seen this shape anywhere before. About four years ago, my son bought me a, one of a, a series of books called Haunted Skies. I can't recall which one it was in, but uh, this this book I was flipping through and 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 I just stopped in my tracks, and I said to Sean, my son, I said, "Hey, here's, here's my UFO. Look." And he said, was it similar to that? I said, no, that is, that's exactly the thing I saw. It's, it's identical. It had the bubble on the top. It had the, what looked like little windows. And they even described it. Um, this, this sighting, I think was about eight or 10 years after mine. Um, they even, dis the color was described as bronze. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was quite took back by that because as up until then, uh, yeah, well, I didn't think I was weird for coming out with this stuff, but it, it, it left a little bit of a doubt in my mind because I'd never seen anything else, you know. Tony, I was just about to say, um, that particular moment must, obviously you were probably frightened and that, you know, you didn't know what had happened. Uh, was it a kind of like, like your parents said, was it kind of the time that you should either dismiss it or go full in and say, right, I want to find out what that was? Was that the kind of feeling you had immediately or did it take a, a, a while? Uh, my, my, when I actually witnessed this object, um, strangely, I wasn't afraid. And um, that surprised me, really. I, I had an overwhelming sense of calmness and like almost at one with everything, almost in a trance, I guess. Um, I, I don't really know how else to describe it, but that, that's how I felt. Yeah. Uh, after, afterwards, I, almost straight away started trying to find out where I could source more information on this subject. And in those days, it, it wasn't like today you can switch on a computer and it's all just there. I went to the library. They had a couple of books. Um, and just as a side issue, go to libraries now and see how many UFO books you can find. You won't find hardly any, if any at all, for some reason. But none the more for that. There, I found out there was a magazine called Flying Saucer Review, 
So I subscribed to that and got that coming through every month. Um, and it, it was a very much it was quite amateurish in some ways, but the, but the information was there, and that's all I really needed. And that's all there was. There was nothing else. So it was quite an upward. Later on, about, a, I don't know, a year or two later, I found out that there were UFO groups. In those days, almost every big town had one. Cambridge had one, Newmarket, Kings Lynn, Downham Market, Wisbridge. They all had a UFO group. Um, it was massive then. Um, and, and I'd actually joined the Cambridge UFO group, but it was towards the death throes of it. I think there was some in, in fighting, I, I think I recall. And, um, so I, I stopped going basically. And, and thereafter, it, I seemed to go in fits and starts with this research. Sometimes I would spend days researching, then I'd go weeks without doing anything in the early days. So there's certainly been, you think that there's been a decline, uh, which is a surprise. As you said, you know, with modern technology, things like that, you'd have thought more people would be out there looking and watching the skies. I think, unfortunately, um, people have become lazy and it's easy, as people believe, to source it all on the internet. Unfortunately, as you guys know, a huge amount of the stuff on the internet is either mistaken stuff, it's false, it's fake, uh, and it's difficult now to know what is real or, or what is a potential real sighting or other information and what is just pure fiction. It's, 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 it's difficult to disseminate between the two on the internet now. I think we've often discussed before on this show how the internet is both good and bad. It's good in that it's a forum for everybody so that people can access information. But unfortunately, it's also a a, a free forum, whereas people can come up with ridiculous, you know, ideas. And like you say, I mean, false news deliberately mislead people too. And I think that sometimes perhaps makes it difficult to discuss a topic like this in a credible fashion. Absolutely. Yeah. I think perhaps yeah. in the past where people would record something via old-fashioned cameras or talk to journalists from local newspapers, this kind of thing, that there may well have been a more accurate recording of facts and events than all the speculation and gossip that we tend to get today. Yeah. Um, the passage of time is interesting in this. Do you think in general, I mean, let's for the moment just sideline that sort of some of the stuff that is on the internet, like I said, a lot of it has no merit, that... In general, social attitudes of people towards ufology and being respectful and open-minded towards people that are into ufology has improved across the years. I, I would definitely say yes, um, and I think there's several reasons why this is. To give you an example, in the 70s, uh, when I had my sighting, and I was telling everybody uh, for some time afterwards, and I can't recall how long, but it would be months, if not a year or so, I, I can't recall, but I was ridiculed terribly. I, uh, when I walked past people, they, they would talk about little green men. Uh, I have to say also, uh, at this point, mentioning little green men, in 40 some odd years of researching this, I've never come across a sighting where there was a little green man, but none the more for that. Uh, so I, I soon learned not to tell people anymore. And I had many years not telling anybody outside of groups uh, about this. But nowadays, if you get people, especially on their own, they're fascinated about the subject and they want to talk and they want to listen. And you can have some really nice chats with people and listen to them. As soon as you, every time you put an extra person into the equation, the potential, depending on the people, is is for ridicule to start coming in. And uh, mm-hmm. but generally speaking, I agree with you one hundred percent. It's it's far easier now uh, to talk to people than it used to be. Um, even my recent radio interviews, all but one, uh, have been so so positive. And even the one that I wasn't that positive, wasn't that ridiculing that it used to be. And 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 that's actually quite nice because it means they're taking you seriously at last. And I I, I guess. It's something to do with the internet, so that's the positive about it all, because a lot more people are becoming unaware and and asking questions. It's also to do with television, because there's hardly an evening go by on Sky where there isn't a program uh, about some form of UFOs or ancient aliens, stuff like that, and it's all positive. A few years ago, almost every program on Sky, for instance, um, was had a ridiculing... Uh, narration or aspect to it all Mm -hmm. Um, and as for newscasts uh, a few years ago everyone was was 
it was a total total Mickey take, and and the newscaster would always finish off with a with a laugh, and and which basically said, yeah. you know, we're not taking this seriously, so if we're not, you don't need to either. But now, when this stuff come up, it it's not quite as bad as it used to be. Um, so yeah, I th- I think more people are taking this a lot more seriously than they used to be. But unfortunately, they're not getting off their backsides. Um, do you think it's because there's a lot of credible scientists uh, like Brian Cox, people like that, who, um, when, when you put the numbers of how many other worlds are probably out there, um, people are becoming more open to saying, hang on, we are living in a huge you know, universe and there, there must be potential for this, this kind of thing. Do you think people are just a bit more open-minded? I, I think so. Uh, it's nice to hear people like Brian Cox and various people at SETI and various other places saying that there is life out there. However, uh, I will say that, uh, especially Brian Cox, Brian Cox is very good at self-promotion. He's, he's doing very well with his business. Uh, and he, and I'm not, I'm not saying he's not an educated man and he doesn't know what he's talking about. But he, like a lot of other people, have agendas, and the agenda does, and the UFO field doesn't fit that agenda. Um, but even so, I, I would say that they are helping to promote the thought in almost everybody that there, there is alien life out there somewhere. It's just that they're not here at the moment, and that's where I disagree with them. Well, I think the the broader topic of extraterrestrial existence, I mean, it, it's fascinating. And we you can almost run off into philosophical territory with it. Uh, there's two ways. Either we're alone, which makes us incredibly special, or because the amount of galaxies, the amount of um, stars that we now know have planets, what we call extrasolar planets in this day and age. Obviously, yeah. astronomy yeah. tells us these things are out there now. Which for a long yeah. time, it was speculation and theory. So to assume that we're alone would be arrogant on our behalf. The circumstances that brought life into being here, by all means and by all variables, could easily have occurred elsewhere in the universe. And I think personally that we would be arrogant to assume that we're alone. Uh, absolutely, I agree 100%. Uh, I, I, it also, you use almost weekly, there is some announcement of either another potentially habitable habitable planet there or they they they're doing something else in the space industry you've got various contractors coming up and saying we're now going to be doing this i mean there's one recently who come out and said he knows he spent millions actually i think he said billions but this may is have the been russian millions. guy no this is oh um, i can't think of his name offhand uh, this is not the guy who does the x uh, thingy, um, oh, whatever it is. I can't think of his name offhand. Um, but he, uh, uh, I think he made his money in property and what have you. And he's got, mm-hmm. he's a billionaire and he's putting vast amount of money in, into the space industry now. And he has come out and said that he knows these things exist and they're here right now. Um, uh, what NASA will think of him saying that, uh, that I don't know as he's one of their contractors, but it's everywhere. It's everywhere you look every single week. There's something out there telling you it's almost like we're being prepared for something. And, uh, and I believe there is an element of that in, in all of this. The NASA aspect, um, is something I find interesting because I, I kind of in my, perhaps I'm wrong to do this, but in my own mind, I kind of catalog it along with things like the MOD and various, shall we say, government agency things, because these are organisations that are ultimately answerable and under the control of national governments. Do you think, with like the gentleman you've mentioned, with more wealthy individuals or possibly private industry ventures, that we will actually start to see a lot more? Because it, it's it's not solely in the preserve of government anymore. It's It's private individuals, it's industries and stuff that start to to fund research and stuff and organizations like SETI and I believe they do have a certain amount of private investment do you think now that it's kind of becoming more open like that that we perhaps will see a little bit more information uh, I have no proof in what I'm now saying but my 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 feeling is for some time we've been slowly drip drip fed uh, this this alien on earth either as visitors or and some are here all the time uh, situation and it's increasing in in intensity i believe 
it's all for a reason and I also believe that these contractors and so forth there will be more information coming out and it will increase in in frequency as well uh, I the NASA uh, there's a, a famous a ufologist called Stanton Friedman he believes mm -hmm. it stands for never a straight answer because <laughs> I believe they're a military body and uh, the face, when you go to Florida and you visit round and it's lovely, it's like a theme park and all the staff are lovely, but I believe that they're, they're, they have equipment that is far surpasses what they're actually using now. I think it's, it's a front. It's a, I believe it's a front. Uh, for the population of the uh, of the world, even not just America, uh, to to hide up a lot more of what's going on. Well, NASA still has aspects of its space program that it keeps very quiet about. I mean, they, mm. the, the I don't know I don't have the actual name to hand, but I know they have a miniaturized unmanned version of the space shuttle, mm. and they have two or three of these, and um, they've launched these things into orbit for one year, two years, I believe. One's just been up for almost three years before yep. retrieving it for a landing. And they're still not very forward about what the function and use of this this spacecraft is. Um, there's stuff that's been launched into space that a lot of us know very little about for many years. I mean, obviously, you have, you have the aspect of the Cold War, reconnaissance satellites and so on. It We weren't told much about it, but it went on. So, I mean, it, it, it's not a stretch to believe that there's stuff going on that they're not keeping the public informed about because they're used to not keeping the public informed about a lot of things. Uh, absolutely. Do you know... I, I I equate this whole phenomenon uh, to a jigsaw puzzle, and this jigsaw puzzle is the size of a side of a large truck. It's massive, this jigsaw puzzle, this whole phenomenon, and I believe I personally have got like a dozen bits of the jigsaw here, a dozen bits there, and it's spread all over the whole side of the truck. That's all I've got, and to try and make a, an accurate picture of what's going on from that is extremely difficult if 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 not impossible but there as you rightly say that they, they've they've certainly got lots of secret stuff and you would expect that anyway but um i think it's a lot deeper than what we're being told i think it i think it was the ceo of the skunk works lockheed skunk works who do all the top secret stuff mm -hmm. for america he actually come out and said he said we have the technology now to take E.T. home. Um, he said, everything you see on Star Trek, we already have. Um, and, and this is the CEO of Lockheed Skunk Works. I, per I mean, I've done a lot of research. I go all over the world talking to people and go to conferences, meeting people. I was in Florida on vacation and I got talking to this guy. Um, my wife was with me. And we got talking about this subject and he actually said, he told me he works for Lockheed and he showed me his pass. They got some security clearance on it and what have you, which meant nothing to me. And he said, do you remember Ronald Reagan's Star Wars? I said, oh, yeah. I said, I remember something about that. And I said, but it never happened. Did it? And he said, well, actually, it did. He said the, they're out there now surrounding the planet. He said, for quite a way out. He said, but what's interesting is most of them are not pointing in toward the planet to try and blast the Soviets, what was then uh, nuclear missiles. They're facing outwards. He said, just ask yourself why that is. And uh, he wouldn't tell. The guy was drunk, so he may have been <laughs> drunk. But drunk people don't usually lie. And also, he showed me his badge. So whether it was true or not, I don't know. But it was very interesting. Well, there is that old saying that sometimes when people get drunk, the truth comes out, which yeah. sometimes is the case. People lose that inhibition and they may be a little bit more forward. I will just quickly elaborate for the, the benefit of any younger listeners. The Star Wars project, I believe, was a project via the Reagan administration in the 1980s. And I think the basic premise of the Star Wars project was a series of satellite-based um, weapon systems in orbit. The idea being that this system would destroy Soviet ICBMs as they passed before coming into re-enter. Um, I believe that was the basic premise of the Star Wars project. Um, obviously, any such weapon system like that would be quite an advanced system. So, really, I mean, this interest, it, this this has been a, a lifetime of um, intrigue and love for you, Tony. And talk to us a little bit about the origins of the East Anglian UFO group. Is this what's inspired you? Did you found the group or did you have you come in on into the group and ended up as the leader of the group? And tell us a little bit about the origins of the East Anglian UFO group, if you can, please, Tony. Yeah, well, uh, in actual fact, as, as you now know, I've been researching the subject uh, as a sole character uh, since the 1970s. 
70s and over the years amassed a whole pile of books, magazines and all sorts of stuff, um, loads on the on the computer and what have you. Uh, I was actually, as a hobby, uh, compiling uh, quotations from famous people, military people, people to do with air, uh, aeronautics, astronautics, or whatever. And I was compiling, and I got a massive database. And uh, my son just said to me one day, um, he said, you know, you ought to produce a website for all this stuff. He said, I know this site's with a few uh, quotations. He said, but, you know, you've got hundreds. He said, you ought to have a website so people can access this stuff. Well, at the time, my son and there was one or two others, we used to have not, not even informal meetings. We would just talk about the subject over many years um, and once we launched the website we decided to put together a Facebook page and that just escalated with lots of people some people said well sh could we have some meetings and what have you and it just kept escalating basically and uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago we started having regular meetings so the actual meetings are quite uh, quite new in actual fact and we we hold them in Newmarket once a month and uh uh, they are held at the social club. We meet once a month. It's the third Monday of every month, unless it's unless there's a bank holiday, and then we don't don't uh, uh, we don't hold one then. And it's the uh, Studlands Sports and Social Club on the Studlands Estate in Newmarket. So it's just off the motorway. Really easy to get to, and uh, we we send out in, invites, but anybody's uh, able to come along. We charge three pounds entry. Um, it's a non-profit making thing. And what that, what we do is we, uh, accumulate all that money coming in, which isn't a great uh, amount. And we have a raffle. And when we get enough money, we hire a speaker to come in. Uh, sometimes they come in relatively cheap. Sometimes we have to pay a bit more. And we we've had some interesting talks already. Um, when we don't have a speaker, we usually put a, a documentary on or, or we do our own PowerPoint presentation and we'll have a natter afterwards. The next meeting, for instance, I think we have a 40 minute documentary. It's a Russian documentary, so it's got subtitles and it's all about the expedition by America uh, to the Antarctic where they sent thousands of troops. Um, and uh, it's alleged that they got attacked by UFOs and they lost a lot of troops, a lot of airplanes, and they came running back with a tail between the legs. And we're just going to discuss the thing afterwards and, and just, you know, just, just uh, have a bit of a chin wag as well. And that sounds like a fascinating story. And this has come from Russian sources. Uh, well, no, no, well, this particular documentary has, uh, but, but it, it, it's out there in the public domain. Uh, there's mm -hmm. various, uh, but it's also documented and, you can get uh, letters backwards and forth and what have you from the freedom of information thing in America. So it's all there. It's all documented. Uh, but the UFO bit, conveniently, on the official sources, uh, has been removed. But if you look at some of the original letters that he sent and interviews that he said... It, 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 the guy who ran it, um, I think his name was General Bird. I think his name was. Uh, it's all there, but he was he after he come out with all this information, the American military basically shoved him underground on a on a, a desk job and basically silenced him. Do you think the end of the Cold War has brought to prominent has prominence a lot more of this stuff? I mean, a lot more information comes out now. I mean, we take for example. I mean, the Americans' stealth projects. I mean, we we got the was it the F one seventeen Nighthawk stealth fighter, mm. and also I believe later, a little bit later, not much later, the B two stealth bomber. I believe these were products of the Skunk Works, weren't they? I believe I mean, yeah. America has had this sort of highly advanced stealth materials technology for quite a while, and they did deny it for quite a while, and yet. In towards the late eighties, they would then became quite open that they had this technology. I mean, I'm sure we can all remember the the sort of footage of the first Gulf War when this this sort of technology was used quite extensively, and at that time, they were quite open about it. But obviously, it was technology they had had for some time prior to that. Yeah, I, I, it's obvious that all all military are going to have um, equipment and hardware that they don't want their their potential enemies to know about so mm -hmm. you know and you can you can understand that as well it's it's just that uh i believe that there's a lot more going on than what we can even imagine um at, at the moment and it's it's based on photographs and and testimony from other people and what have you but you mentioned the cold war uh 
a lot more information came out from behind the Iron Curtain uh, immediately after the, 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 the Soviets fell out of fashion, uh, when there was glasnost and, 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 and it became more open. There's mm-hmm. actually uh, several Russian um, uh, ufologists. Um, hold on, I can tell you the name. Oh, no, I can't. Um, there's, there's, who have at that time pulled out so much material. Funnily enough, it's now they've closed the doors behind them and you now can't get any material out. But at the time, they pulled out such, so much material. And when you know what went on, uh, with, with, with some of the, uh, the, the Russians and, and what have you, uh, they had massive amounts of UFO activity. They had fighters going up, um, and, and basically having dogfights with the things. Um, Marina Popovich, um, who, uh, she, I mean, she was very, she's very famous worldwide in aviation and what have you. She holds, I think it's a, something like 107 aviation world records. Uh, she, um, she holds a license for 40 different types of aircraft. She's one of the most famous Russian Russian uh, cosmonauts and um, pilots in history, and she was a, a military person. She was a colonel, and she she's come out and said that you know she's lost so many of her friends in dogfights with UFOs that the 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 Russian government actually rescinded the order to attack them. They said just let them get on with what they're doing because we can't we can't do anything with them. Um, and then the Americans had a similar thing as well, where they they lost so many pilots. But you don't see or hear any of this on 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 the news. Um, well, on the UK news and in America. But funnily enough, the more you get toward what we consider mm, um, lesser countries, well, I wouldn't, but some people would, like South in South America and, and China and what have you, where people think, mm, yeah, it's a bit dodgy. But really, there's so much material come out there, uh, even in Europe. It's it's just that the press hold back on everything. I mean, like mass sightings, for instance. Uh, in this country, you'd think, well, it's just the occasional person sees a little light in the sky. It's a big deal, but it's not like that. I mean, in in um, in China, Belgium, Mexico, Portugal, Italy, and um, South America, and in Phoenix, Arizona, that one did get out of the public domain. But there's mass sightings where thousands and tens of thousands of people actually see these things. Uh, and not just one, they sometimes see several of them. And they film them, they're on television. But do we ever see them here? No. I, they would rather talk about the elections or terrorism, trying to scare us and, and what have you. But these things are happening all the time outside of the UK. It's just that we never get to hear about it here. Yeah, there was a famous, I would say famous, I mean, there, it had some notoriety. Um, a video I, I noticed on YouTube recently, I believe that was filmed somewhere in South America, Southern South America, Chile or Argentina. And it's footage from a helicopter. Are you aware of this? And it actually tracks, uh, this helicopter was actually filming that like a, had an open hatch in the side of a utility helicopter and they had a, a cameraman in the back of this helicopter. I believe they were filming for something else, a documentary on the weather or something along this line. And they caught what was like a, a an object they couldn't describe in the, in the distance in this video footage. And this helicopter actually tracked this object for a good 10 minutes or so. I'm not actually aware of that one, I don't think. I'm aware of, uh, I think it was Brazil. It was a military aircraft and they were filming something for the weather um, with uh, like an infrared camera. So with the that naked may eye, be the same one. I yeah, may have my wires crossed here. They uh, they couldn't see it with the naked eye, but when they looked through, there was five or six basically UFOs flying along. I mean, the skeptics say, oh, they were just oil rigs burning off. But there has been a television program where they investigated that, and it and it wasn't the oil rigs burning off at the top of the j- rigs and what have you. But uh, yeah, and um, those pilots. This gives you an example of how free they are abroad. Those pilots. Pilots wearing uh, and crew that was on that airplane for the instance I'm talking about, uh, they were encouraged to talk to the UFO fraternity and tell them everything they knew. In actual fact, I think it is Brazil again, where the UFO fraternity are actually they have regular meetings um, with the military and the military give them everything they've got. Um, but you don't get that here. It, it's all. It's all kept down and, and hidden under the, uh, you know, the, the, in America it's exactly the same. But as you get, as you get into Europe, 
it's 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 a lot less swept under the carpet it's 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 more a lot more open and in china for instance i mean here's a here's a country with a, a massive amount of of people there i think it's is it one and a half almost one and a half billion people um and Half of the population either believe or have seen UFOs. They've had mass sightings, and the UFO fraternity there, unlike here, it consists of of, of university professors, scientists, uh, and and people with high credibility researching the subject. And here, if anybody of any standing gets involved with this this phenomenon, they're ridiculed and they're ostracized from wherever whoever they're dealing with. And, and it's done for a reason. They're threatened, and it's so to keep the secret. And I believe that's what's going on. Um, if, if that is the case, um, I, I wouldn't say either way. If that is the case, that I think sometimes it's interesting that there's a flaw in that tactic that comes to light. Uh, it's interesting you say that because there, is it the story of the, um, you'll have to correct me if I get my facts wrong here, Tony. It was the story of the Water Beach, Bent Waters ah. slash Lake and Heath sighting in the late 50s. Yeah. It's and I awesome. believe. Was it Bent Waters tracked a UFO and they informed Lakenheath? Yeah. Who he, it was 52, I think. Um, and you're yeah. right. It was Bent Waters and Lakenheath. In actual fact, there was three radars picked this up. I think right. it was Bent, Bent Waters, Lakenheath, and the radar on the Canberra jet that was uh, scrambled from Waterbeach. Uh, I think they actually scrambled a second one as well. And yes, they, they, they gave chase and... Uh, uh, yeah, um, but here again, that that one in those days in this country, people were it was all in the papers and everybody, you know, all the stuff was coming out. Now, if that happened, you wouldn't know anything about it. I mean, right. I I talk to a lot of military. I've got a lot of friends in the military who give me nods and they give me winks. Um, there's one certain chap who's uh, and I'm, I'm going to be very careful what I say because he values his job in the air force. He was basically flying up the North Sea with another guy and this white orb ran past them like they were standing still. And he doesn't normally fly. And he said, my goodness, what was that? The pilot said, it's nothing you need to concern yourself with. I'll tell you more when we land. Anyway, they landed and he said about all this, this, this thing, what was it, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, do you value your job in the RAF? Do you want to stay working in there and do you want promotion? This guy I'm talking about said, yes. He said, don't put it in your log then. He said, because I'm not going to. He said, because you put it in your log, you will never get promotion. And the first chance you get, they get, they'll oust you. Um, he spoke to his friend who worked on some radar and he said, this happened. He said, yeah, I know I was watching it. He said, just watching it. What do you do about it? He said, nothing. He said, we don't even bother reporting it. He said, and you don't want to either. He said, how, the, the guy who witnessed this said, how often does this happen? And he said, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly. He said, we see them all the time. And he said, what are they? This guy who's in the aircraft. And the other guy said, he's winking. He said, your guess is as good as mine. And so, but it never comes out anymore. Uh, it never comes out. I have a high ranking officer friend who flies and he just winks and nods when I talk to him. He won't tell me anything, but he said, but he has told me, he said, nobody dare tell you anything. He said, because you'd lose your career. So I've heard this from two different sources years ago in the fifties when the water beach, uh, um, situation, uh, happened. It got in the press. So it's there. Uh, for, for, for all to see. Um, but nowadays you wouldn't hear about that sort of stuff. I believe there was a degree of dis, um, dismissal, as it were, on the behalf of the Royal Air Force, because like you say, I believe they sent aircraft up from Water Beach in order to intercept this contact. But I also believe from what I understand is that the actual intercept itself, um, that radio operators that either Lake and Heath or Bentwater were listening it in on, and that the account that those radio U.S. Air Force radio operators gave later contradicted the account that was officially released by the Royal Air Force, whereas the Royal yep. Air Force turned around and said basically, oh, there was a contact, but we can't describe it, whereas the U.S. account, who said they were monitoring the intercept on radio, actually makes it sound like there was a lot more activity and a lot more going on during this intercept. Uh, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. That's everything. Yep, that's all true. What... what to the best of my knowledge, what you've just said. Uh, there are some quotes from 
uh, the pilot who now won't actually repeat that quote, but there, but he won't deny that he said it. I uh, can't remember what it was, but basically he was saying that the this thing this thing isn't from this earth or but 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 that's not what he said but that's mm. in essence what he was getting at yeah there was a lot more to the story i'm actually researching it in more depth at the moment to put together uh, a video documentary about it i think it's also interesting what you said about how the pilot described as look if you don't log it in your flight book keep quiet about it if you want your career to go on etc etc but it wasn't just that there's this sort of unwritten code to keep quiet about it that they seem to adopt and that they advise their colleagues to adopt. Mm. What I also find fascinating is that he sounded quite flippant. It's no big deal. See it all the time. But we don't mm. talk about it. That mm. kind of attitude, it, that's how it seems to come across to me. I I didn't know until recently that, that radar, because um, I don't understand the, 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 the physics of it all, but apparently it, it seems to go only up to a certain height and Mm -hmm. and they it's tuned so that they only uh detect craft which are traveling within the scope of what an aircraft can travel plus and minus a little bit perhaps um because they can tune it because if they have it like wide you know apparently it makes it better if it's more finely tuned and in the 50s um the, the, there's no doubt that the radar wasn't quite as accurate as it is today but like i said the the skeptics come out with three or four things uh on the negative side with this this um this this sighting but it's more than outweighed by i've actually got a whole bunch a whole file on this subject but i can't talk now because i i don't recall accurately the information I'm, I'm giving you but like i said i am researching it it is fascinating it did happen and i think the skeptics are there just to muddy the waters no it's it's fascinating to touch on it in any capacity to, or, or in any depth i mean it, it's a it really is an interesting subject and whilst we're on the sort of subject of local sightings um i was having a look at a bit of a look at the um, east anglian ufo website last night i will say it's it's a very easy it's a very clean and very comprehensive website. I mean, you've you mentioned earlier that it's still some of a work in progress that you've got a lot of information yet to go on there. But what impresses me about the website is I find I found it was very clean. It was a quick website. It followed links through and protocols through very quickly. And it, that it's very easy for the user to come in and navigate and access the information on that website. It's very, it's a bit of a Ron Seal website. You know, it does what it says on the tin. It's very functional. <laughs> yeah. We, um, we, we actually had a bit of a dilemma when we, when we built the thing because yeah. one school of thought was let's just make it all whizzy or wushy and modern and have modern ways of doing things. But then we thought, look, if people, if, if the average person is trying to source something here, let's, yeah. The other sort, the other way of thinking was, shall we just make it simple? Uh, buttons that look like buttons that you don't have to look to where to click. And yeah, it's like you just said, it does what it says on the tin. It's not all singing and all dancing, but it does what it says. And well, so, you know, like I said, I mean, I've referenced it recently in preparation for this podcast interview. And, um, I, I certainly from that more research point of view appreciate the fact that the links are quick and it, it's it's categorized clean and it's very easy to reference for your information and um there's also a form on there i know you've got for people to contact the east anglian ufo group about mm-hmm. sightings they've had themselves mm-hmm. um would that be possible for anyone who wished to do so to do so anonymously and would you respect that oh definitely in actual fact mo- very few come through the website um we we seem to get them on just an email sent to me uh when we talk to somebody uh i ask them if, if we're researching their sighting or whatever it is uh we ask them if they mind if their name is used if they do we don't sometimes it's like mrs h from hunstanton or whatever uh, sometimes we don't even put that down it's not essential to have the names because we realize that some people are quite sensitive you know for this information to come out and we we do actually respect that yes the reason I say that, we have a local listener, and Mark would probably be able to tell you more than I have, who says they've witnessed something, but um, as of such, they've not put that towards the podcast. I mean, obviously, we work on the same premise. If somebody contacts us and re- re- wishes to remain anonymous, we will respect that. So I don't know, Mark, perhaps if our listener who witnessed something would uh, want to consider at some point contacting the East Anglian UFO group and sending them their story. Yeah, I'll certainly have a, a chat with this person about that. No, no, it's uh, going to be treated anonymous, not anonymously because I guess 
like Tony said, some people are a bit a bit afraid to come forward, and you know they don't want to be ridiculed by their friends and colleagues, etc., like that. You know, so yeah, that that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah that's, that's spot on, Mark. I mean, in actual fact, the group meetings, uh, we a lot of the people that go there have told us stuff that they would never tell anybody else anywhere else. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons we held these meetings, uh, it was almost like a sanctuary. It was a place where people could come and talk without feeling they're going to be laughed at because there's some really unusual stories we've been told uh, we have one member for instance who sees uh, not so much these days he's managed to filter them out but somebody who knows about this stuff said he's, he's best to embrace uh, the gift that he's got and he sees dead people walking around he sees aliens walking around and he sees people sleeping walking around people in their sleep who are uh, astro astro travel do they call it or something like that they they um and he sees all these people and uh you you talk to a lot of people about this and they just laugh um and this guy doesn't tell people just for that reason and um we respect that in actual fact i've known about this man and what he sees for some time and to this to this day, his name has never been given to anybody mm -hmm. because we respect the, the his wishes of anonymity. Yeah, you have to. I mean, like you say, some people are happy to have it put forward, and some people, like you say, you do have to respect that. We we run very much the same way as a podcast. We um we always ask for someone's consent before publishing a name or a story or what have you when we come across it. Getting back to the local sightings thing a little bit. Yeah. I mean, there's some that really sort of fascinated me. Um, going through through the the East Anglian UFO website. And that's March. March seems to be a bit of a hotbed, doesn't it? it it's had its share of sightings. And, and I have to say that the sightings that we have to put up on the website are far outweigh what's already on there at the moment. We just don't mm -hmm. get the time. We're, we put up about 10 to 20 items a month. But we're, we're just slowly drifting. We're, we're getting further and further behind. But yes, March is a bit of a hot spot. Rendlesham Forest uh, in Suffolk is a hot spot. And of course probably the the most or the second most uh, spectacular and important sighting of all time throughout the world happened at Rendlesham um, or Woodbridge um, when the, um, the American base is there and uh, yeah I mean the whole of East Anglia is actually uh, quite a quite a hot spot in various areas. There was one from the sort of March Chatteris area looking at them that I wanted to ask you about because it kind of ties into a question I have on the subject um, I, don't, I don't know that you'll have a specific answer but I think it's worth me putting it to you anyway is a, a gentleman I, I don't know if this is a pseudonym or the guy's actual name but he's he's, he's on here is reg wen from chatras mm -hmm. um he said i i don't know if the photo is on your website but it says that he sent a photo of an object he captured from his home in acre fen mm -hmm. and to quote mr wen he said i have been tracking one of these for over 16 years it appears in the sky south of my home from time to time I managed to get a picture of it a few weeks back, as we've just referenced. This thing appears and disappears like switching a light on and off, so I imagine it's it's almost instantaneous in the way it appears and disappears. Um, if Mr. Wen has been tracking this for 16 years, have you ever felt compelled, or anyone from the East Anglian UFO group, someone with an interest, to actually go to Mr. Wen's and, and spend a bit of time there? Because it sounds like, you know, this is a... A frequently recurring sighting it yeah. would be something that would be worth investigation as opposed to something that would appear to be a one-off sighting if that makes sense absolutely the we have so many we're investigating at the moment we're just so bogged down with we could really do we have a hundred members in our group or just mm -hmm. under a hundred members um i would say at a guess uh, there's probably only, there's less than 10 that are active members, people that are actually doing anything. Uh, right. And out of those people, they, they have limited amount of time. I spend almost full time on this. Uh, my son and a handful of others uh, do what they can. It, it, we're just snowed under. But you're, you're right, it would be good to, to stake the place out to some extent. At this moment in time, there's two sightings um, one at uh, Stansted Airport and one in Newmarket that we're actually uh, heavily investigating and is taking, you know, all the spare time that we have at the moment. It, it, I imagine it is probably quite difficult because when you're trying to collate that information to bring that information in, you obviously want to be as comprehensive as you can in terms of date, time, 
mm. location, weather. I mean, there's so many factors I imagine that you would like to at least try to record as best you can. And maybe mm. when somebody witnesses something, they don't always immediately think to sort of look at the watch. Oh, it's 20 past nine or I'm just south of Soham or what have you. you know, people yeah. don't necessarily think in that way, do they? No, no. Uh, and, and some of our sightings are sent in by third parties. Some mm-hmm. where people actually contact us direct are, are almost quite, they're quite vague really. And as soon as you start digging under the surface to be a little bit more searching, I've had a few people that actually become a little bit defensive. I mean, I, I, I wonder if they th- they feel that I don't believe them and and they lose their nerve almost and they don't want and they clam up and they don't tell you anymore and and like I said I've actually had two that I can recall in in the last year that have almost said well that's it you know do it use it if you want to I'm not going to tell you anymore um I'm not saying this guy from from um Chatteris would be like that I'm trying to just demonstrate that not everybody is as as we would like to think you know some people get a quite scared about it all yeah yeah i suppose it's, it's it's derision i mean people perhaps fear mockery and like you say maybe there there was a time when, when we, we've mentioned that the the old little green men trope yeah. and people perhaps felt like i'm going to be ridiculed you've seen a flying saucer you've seen martians etc whatever rubbish they were f- worried would be thrown at them and yet these people by all means, could have been rational people that saw something. I mean, the little green men thing, I think, perhaps doesn't help because UFO, I mean, by definition, it is exactly that. It is an unidentified flying object. Now, somebody that sees a UFO isn't saying they've seen little green men. Nope. They're saying they've seen something in the air that they couldn't mm-hmm. explain by conventional yep. means. And yep. it really is that simple, isn't it? It, it is. Uh, and in actual fact... Uh, the last thing we want to do here at the group is to try and make out something that is something is um, is alien based when it could have quite a rational uh, explanation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there are a, a, a huge amount of, of uh, um, l- logical explanations for a lot of the things that come in. The I would say that I don't know. It's just a guess. Ninety eight percent of UFO sightings have a legitimate logical explanation and it covers all sorts of things not in this country but in the states swamp gases of often used well that's a possibility autokinesis there's chinese lanterns i stood on the seafront at hunt stanton listening to these people a few years ago saying oh ufos and they were clearly to me Chinese lanterns and the giveaways are the yellow light the flickering light sometimes it goes out the fact that they were all drifting very slowly in the same direction and it just so happened to be the same direction that the wind was blowing all sorts of stuff like that airplanes and helicopters can be so deceiving and here in the fens those who live in the fens and are near Lake and Heath or Mildenhall when planes are coming towards you very slowly as they're coming into land they appear almost to hang in the sky there and at night time of course their lights they can almost appear to be like like a, a ufo of some sort various mistakes people make you know with uh, uh ufo sightings weren't we if, if you recall mm-hmm. it's, it's uh, funny that you mentioned I, I remember a time in my childhood i'd be in the 1980s sometime it was in the yeah, i'd be early teens 13 14 perhaps yeah. something like that and um, I was coming home from somewhere in the evening. It'd be in the winter, so it was dark. It'd be about eight or nine o'clock at night. And I was coming home on my bike. And I used to live around the sort of Abbott's Way Prize Court area. Of, I don't today. I don't live far from it. But I used to live in the Abbott's Way Prize Court area of Ely. Right. Yep. And there's a bit of a rat run of like old people's complexes and footpaths that ran around an old playing field there. Yep. Yep. And as I was biking down one of them in in the dark... I remembered seeing an object in the sky coming towards me. And the easiest way to describe the way I perceived this object would be, um, if you know, if you think of the sort of 1950s, 1960s flying wing shape that the US Air Force were testing. Yes. Something similar to that sort of profile and that silhouette. And it also had lights on. And like you've mentioned before about aircraft on approach to the local air bases, it seemed very slow, almost hanging in the sky. But it did have like approach lights and strobe lights on it. So I, I, I mean, I at the time I, I did have to take a moment and pause. And it wasn't until it actually passed directly overhead me, I could actually make out the profile and see it was one of the big American tankers that they yeah. had based at Mildenhall. But yeah. for a very brief moment, in, I saw this thing head on, 
And yeah. I couldn't identify specifically what type of aircraft it was. And like yourself, no. I live around here my whole life. I'm used to seeing the American aircraft in the sky. Yeah. And you, you get a good idea of that profile against the grey sky when you first see it. But for a, a brief moment, probably a good 30, 40 seconds, I thought, what on earth am I looking at here? Yeah. And it does, even to a trained eye, it does kind of make that example about how it's easy to mistake How easy something. it is, yeah. Do you know, about three months ago, we, we did a talk about identifying uh, UFOs and have the common mistakes. And one of them was we, we spoke about planets in our solar system, specifically uh, Venus, for example. Mm. And sometimes it's it's quite huge in the sky. And we was only talking about this at the meeting. And by the time I got home, I got emails from group members who had attended the meeting who said, I've just seen a UFO. It was sitting high in the sky on, on, in the south. It just sat there all the time. Mm-hmm. We was going home for half an hour. And I, I, I knew where they were traveling and i worked it out and that was venus <laughs> and we've just been talking about it and it just shows you how people they see something they're not familiar with and they straight away think that could be well it is a ufo at that time but they straight away think that they've seen something you know spectacular this, the space station is another good one i mean if you've ever seen it go overhead yes um it, it, it's just it just goes overhead quite quickly and a lot of people think that's that's something weather inversions even clouds now i was in iceland a couple of years ago and they have these circular clouds there i did know the name but unfortunately i can't recall at the moment and they do look exactly like a flying saucer they even have almost like a dull aluminium um a, a, a feel to them you know when you look at them going around the bus that we was on everybody was looking at it saying it was a flying saucer i took a photograph of it i've actually still got the photograph but by the time i got the camera out one corner of it was wisping away but it really looked like a flying saucer so lots of people do see things that that aren't real they do have a logical ex- explanation to them all do you think it's it's good to have an open skeptic mind when you're looking up to the stars? I think you got to really. It's it's it because otherwise people won't treat you seriously if they think you believe everything is an alien and you're you're scared of your own shadow. People won't think of you seriously. This is this is the problem. The whole UFO scene in this country especially has always had. It it's got this image uh, almost of 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 somebody who's fanatical who who probably doesn't dress too nicely, who smells a bit and 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 as a bit of a loner and he's using it almost like a religion. Um but the reality is most people who are involved in the scene are not like that at all no i mean it is it, i think to a degree it kind of goes back to what you talked we were talking about earlier when we, we talk about the testimony and comments made by pilots i mean these are individuals that not only are they tend to be quite intelligent well-educated trained individuals they're also psychologically assessed f- for the rationality obviously for obvious reasons i mean there's the safety aspect these people have to be stable people and if these people will claim to see things that they can't explain, you mm. have to take that credibly because these people are sound people. Well, a good example, uh, of course, is is if you talk about military, you don't become a four star general or or high ranking in the navy if if you if you're if you're if you're likely to drift with flights of fancy. Now, the amount of four star generals that we have with quotes saying that these things are real is unbelievable. You look on the website, I think there's about 40 odd uh, on our website, but we have so many more to go on. Uh, for I'll, I can give you two, for example, um, Lord Hill Norton. Now, he at one time was first sea lord, chief of the defense staff uh, in the early 70s, I think, and he was the chairman of nato military committee now mm. this guy you don't get any higher than uh, than admiral of the fleet for example now he's he's even on video you can see him on youtube anytime saying these things are real they enter our atmosphere every day we don't know what they are but they're definitely not of this planet but they're somehow extraterrestrial and he's coming out and say it says that air chief marshal lord dowding for instance now he was the commanding officer of the raf during world war ii he he's on record as saying these things are real and they're not from this world. So when people like that, with such high rank, are saying these things, um, Gorbachev, the the Soviet um, premier uh, during the, the the latter years of the Soviet Union, actually said these are extraterrestrial. They should be taken seriously and and not mocked. And he's come out and said that. 
astronauts, Buzz Aldrin, Gordon Cooper, Edgar Mitchell, they've all said that they've either seen things or they are aware that these are real. Uh, Victor, or let me get his name right, it's Af- Af- Anasov, I think his name is, when he went up with two other crew um, in a Soyuz, they could see this flying saucer following them. Um, you get the skeptics say, oh, they were probably ice particles, this, that, and everything else. These people are trained for this stuff. They don't they don't they don't have flights of fancy and why would somebody with such high credibility risk it all for saying something like that i i just don't buy it at all mm-hmm. i mean the, the, to a degree i think that that does tie into a very prominent local case and you've you've already mentioned it yourself in passing which is the Reynoldsham forest RAF woodbridge incident mm. Which was an incident I, the early 1980s at the the twin bases. I just I'll just paint a little bit of a picture. In the Cold War, through to I believe around the early 90s, the U.S. Air Force operated two air bases that ran almost parallel to each other, which was RAF Bentwaters and RAF Woodbridge, and I believe they're sort of roughly in the proximity of Ipswich in Suffolk, can't they? And um, it was in the early, I believe, nuclear weapons may have been stored at either one or possibly even both. I mean, if the information I have is sketchy here, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's on record. People can research it for themselves. But wasn't it in the early 1980s, around the Christmas period, that um, there was an incident in the Rendlesham Forest, which was actually adjacent to one of the gates at RAF Woodbridge? Uh, it, absolutely. I mean, it's a massive story. Uh, way too much to go into here, but you're you're right with everything you say. Uh, there's lots of books available. There's a really good one called Left at Eastgate, which tells you pretty much how it is. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of infighting with one or two of the the, the characters involved, but the but the but the basis of the story um, is all there. And the really nice thing is there's a paper trail. You can actually follow the paper trail to the MOD from the air base and and it's all there in black and white and you can go on the government's own um freedom of information uh, uh, uh area and and pull out these these files where they're reported there was uh tape recordings taken there was photographs although we're not privy to the photographs but the tape recording is out there there's so much so much evidence it's a massive case the skeptics will straight away come out and say, oh, it was the lighthouse. Now, I've been to the site, and you can't see the lighthouse anymore because from the position where the the craft landed, uh, the trees across this field are grown, so you can't see the lighthouse. But these guys were stationed there. They saw the lighthouse every day of the week. They knew what was the lighthouse. And in any case, these lights went up into the sky. They broke into several pieces. They flew away. I mean, lighthouses don't do that, or I've never seen one that flies up into the sky anyway. So you've walked the UFO trail then, sir? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was very interesting. But There, um, there is a yeah. there is an actual physical trail that's cut yeah. into Rendlesham Forest today, isn't it? which I believe they call the UFO trail. They do, yeah. I I mean, like you say, it's a very detailed and comprehensive case with a lot of testimony and a lot of recordings and a lot of statements involved. So I think it's something that we can touch on it, but we don't really want to go into detail. But I will quote the Rendlesham Forest incident for any listeners that are interested. It's a great one to look up. And not only is it local, but as we've said, there is a lot of recorded detail around the Rendlesham Forest incident. And it's a fascinating story. I mean, I... I, I saw about it on a documentary once on the television. I believe, it, as you said earlier, it was on one of the Sky documentaries. And that encouraged me to go on to Wikipedia mm. and uh, look into the history of the bases and so on and so on. Mm. And before I knew it, I'd blown four or five hours just browsing through web pages. Oh, yeah. It is a fascinating story and there's a lot of information out there. So it is one that I would certainly encourage our listeners to perhaps look up and research for themselves. Yeah, I think the important thing with Rendlesham... And also, to be honest, any multiple people sighting is remember that people who witness the same event at the same time, the same day, will perceive things differently from one another. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's been proven with car accidents and robberies and all sorts that people see the same event 
they recall it slightly different from one another and sometimes wildly different and that's what's happened with some of the witnesses at Rendlesham. Some ufologists are getting bogged down with trying to prove one person a liar or one person correct and and, and it's diverting, it, it's basically separating the community and, and, and it's pointless because people do see things and recall things differently. We can say is that multiple people saw something yeah like you say the perception of the individual i mean we would have different perceptions if we witnessed an event that that's normal that human beings do that Um, but it does seem like almost in the background there's something concerted trying to focus on people's different perceptions just to try and destroy any credibility yeah and yet there is a lot of data out there to like i said to listeners i would encourage them to research it if they they want to take an interest not only on ufo level but on a local level it's Absolutely. it's a physical site you can access it to a degree i believe through the ufo trail today um woodbridge i believe is now occupied by the british army after the u.s air force moved out so obviously it is still a working military base and anyone that goes that way you know, you need to be sensitive to that. Mm. Uh, don't stray where you shouldn't um, exercise caution. But it's certainly a, a local story that is fascinating. And I would encourage people to to have a look at it and, to, you know, to, to seek up some of the information on it. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly the biggest story, um, if, if, if for East, even in the UK, I would say. Uh, mm. And it's and it's, it's it's up there with Roswell, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, like you say, I mean, I, I have heard some of the, the recorded radio transcripts that could, because I believe it wasn't incident that actually occurred over a couple of nights that it wasn't just an incident to one night no it wasn't in actual fact it was over three nights but three uh, nights yeah you're, yeah you're right and uh, uh as you rightly say there's so much uh, documentary evidence for this one it's hard to dismiss um i think the story was broke many years later uh by a guy called larry warren and uh <coughs> Yeah, so it, it, it was in the Sun newspaper. I think that's how it got out. Otherwise, we might not still be aware of it all. I do think this year, actually, the, mil- uh, the Ministry of Defence are releasing the documents um, for the years that actually pertain to that event. So it'll be interesting to see what they actually release. Yeah. Um, other local sightings, if we, I'll just mention this one quickly, because it's one that caught my eye last night looking at your website, is the Denver Mill photo. Yes, yes, that's quite interesting. I, uh, that uh, was sent in third party, if I recall. I don't think... I'm not, I'm not, I can't remember exactly the details there, but yes, that was, uh, yeah, Denver Mill just down the road. But of course, we've, we've got some uh, really good current sightings that we're investigating at the moment. Um, last year at, uh, one of our members actually was coming around the roundabout at, uh, Birch Hanger, I think it's called at Stansted. She was oh, yeah. going down the slip road uh, with her two children in the car uh, onto the M11 travelling south and noticed all the cars. They weren't stopped, but they were actually going very slowly and everybody was looking to the left. And there's this massive triangle hovering above the ground with three lights, one on each corner, and uh, this massive light going through the centre of the uh, of whatever it was. It was matte black. It, had, it wasn't actually a triangle. It was more dart-shaped, and it had cut out some what have you. Um, there are pit drawings on the website, but there'll soon be a uh, an artist's impression of it all. Um, and, and they all saw it. All, all the two children saw, saw this. Uh, they'd been interviewed. They all gave the same account. And I said, did you think to take a camera? Each one of these in this car had a phone with a camera Mm -hmm. on. And they just said, didn't think about it. And I guess that's what happened to all the other people going down down there. That was a fascinating sighting. But there's another one in Newmarket. Um, This happened many years ago. Uh, Two young girls, one of them had just got a car or a driving license or something. And they were just riding around like you do when you first get a car on the road. They pulled up outside this village uh, just on the outskirts of Newmarket, saw these lights dancing around in the distance over some houses. Then, to the best of my recollection, the thing landed in the field opposite. Through the hedge, they could see the bright lights. It took off. And it flew over top of them very low, about the height of a house. Um, they got a good view of it all. Uh, we're actually making, getting the story all together and doing some uh, hypnosis uh, regression uh, to get more detail, hopefully. Um, but, it, you know, it, fascinating story. It really, really is. Was it the incident in the 1950s where there, there was a small light aircraft somewhere in the Americans? I think it, it, it was perhaps around Colorado or the Rockies. It was somewhere in the mountains, wasn't it? It was one of the first recorded... 
incidents of an aircraft pilot seeing UFOs. I believe, uh, some, oh God, I'm so sketchy on this. <laughs> um, it was um, some yeah, pilot was, in a, a small light aircraft somewhere in the mountains. His name was, I think his surname was Arnold. And, yes, uh, thank you so funny. much, Tony. <laughs> yeah, and he was, um, uh, he spotted some flying wings effectively. He said they yes. looked a little bit like saucers skipping a skipping across the sea or water or something they were bobbing up there. and um uh, that's where many believe the term flying saucer came from but uh, right. the reality is uh it that was the first of the popular press getting involved with with the saucers but the reality is these things have been seen all the way back in an antiquity and uh there's so many examples there are accounts and wood carvings depicting a battle being taken place in the Middle Ages over the skies of Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, there's even on the on the on the uh, wood carving, there there's an image of a flying disc on in flames crashed into the ground, and this is from the Middle Ages. Uh, Christopher Columbus, if you read the real text of his diary rather than the ladybook version of ladybird version of the the historical event they had these blue light following them following the three boats the three ships the what were they called the nina the pinta and the santa maria and mm -hmm. and as they got toward where they was they the americas it took off and went in, up into the sky and uh, uh there's all sorts of stories from way back when of triangular craft um and and saucers and cigar shaped objects uh, or tubular type objects and they've been seen right the way back uh, and they're mentioned um, in scripts and what have you from all over the world going right back to almost almost prehistory so in, in a way I mean this is this is a primitive form of documentation and this is this is fascinating because as with most forms of documentation as technologies come along the way we document has changed and uh, getting back to the Arnold thing I think it was from sort of the sort of 1950s onwards when mm. a lot of photographs started to appear of unexplained aerial phenomenon and of course that's then led into video and so on through to today um if we go back to i mean if i remember my own childhood pre the sort of just prior to the digital revolution as such and um i mean i remember in my childhood owning an old um film camera and you had to take your kodak film up to boots or wherever to get it oh, developed yes. and you, yep. you'd, you'd get 25 snaps back three with the head missing two <laughs> or three they'd developed poorly and so on i mean we've all been there we all remember these times yeah and um in, in this particular day and age, I mean, as you've mentioned, most of us have a smartphone or a tablet or some sort of device on us which has the facility to record quite good quality photographs and video. Mm. Do, is it surprising that we're not maybe seeing as much stuff out there? Well, that's in a this very day and age. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Uh, in the old days, when you had real film, uh, uh, just to sidetrack slightly, we, we've actually stopped uh, trying to analyse photographs because, quite frankly, now and video they can be faked so easily by amateurs and right. so well that it's almost impossible to uh, to work out if something is real or fake if it's been well done now in the old days when somebody took a photograph they could be analyzed and there was various ways that you could work out if it had been faked or they could work out by shadows light reflection and all sorts of stuff um but nowadays you can't you can't do that and the same goes for video um the, the problem was years ago you people would have these photographs and they'd say oh that's just a fuzzy picture you know and, and, and now the digital age is here and you get these crisp uh, clean photographs of of craft or potentially craft and people say oh it's it's too clean an image you know it must be fake so yeah. you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't the problem is with the present day it can be fake so easy and and it's almost impossible uh to work out if it is a fake or not that's why we don't now actually on our facebook page you'll see very few photographs or videos of flying saucers or whatever anymore because because it, you just can't tell if they're fake or not it must be quite tricky because like you say if the quality is poor 
you then put an, an image out there that's open to people's interpretation would turn around and say, that could be anything. Yeah. Or if the image quality is extremely good, people will turn around and say, well, that's clearly staged because of how good the quality is. In, in a way, yeah. you cannot win. No. Uh, the, what you, what you, one needs to do now to, to work out what's going on, there's lots of other ways. Um, the government are releasing papers all over the world. All the governments are releasing papers and there's some real gems in there. The CIA have just really, I've just spent weeks going through i think it's about fourteen thousand documents Ooh. and there's so much interesting stuff in there uh that most people don't realize that even the, like the american air force just to give you this example have got in their instruction manuals a reporting procedure for when you see ufos and what you're looking at and what have you it, it's all out there you just got not got to look at photographs and video anymore that's just one part of the evidence string that you can't rely on anymore but there's so much other stuff well we, i mean they had notable um attempts in the past with things like project blue book to deliberately mm. investigate and encourage pilots to record things at one time i mean like clearly there's there's still some form of protocol that is followed even if it doesn't have a name well actually there's not anymore not with the, the americans and nor the english um really yeah, the English, uh, there was a small office, uh, the last, I think it was the last guy who ran it was a guy called Nick Pope, who's mm -hmm. still quite prevalent in the UFO field. Some people think he's a disinformation guy, but I, I don't know. Uh, but the America is the same. Project Blue Book, for instance, uh, for example, yes, it was, it was a public relations exercise. Okay. Uh, a, guy, a guy called J. Allen Hynek, he was an American astronomer, professor, and uh, eventually became a ufologist. Uh, he worked for the government uh, for many years and he was a UFO on Project Blue Book and other uh, Project Grunge, which was a, the predecessor to uh, Blue Book. And he was a UFO skeptic. He really was. And he was actually told uh, when he worked for the CIA, you know, these are all the different ways that you can explain them away um, and if you can't explain them away find any old rubbish to explain them away basically they wanted an answer for everything other than alien or extraterrestrial um, he eventually swapped sides after realizing all the lies that the air force was telling uh, and after interviewing many credible witnesses um, he had scores of uh, military pilots seeing them and such compelling evidence he, he swapped sides in actual fact most people who if they look at the end of um, Close Encounters of the First of the Third Kind, where the big ship comes down and there's mm -hmm. all these people around, he has a cameo appearance on there. He's a guy who walks forward with a, a little goatee beard, and that's J. Allen Hynek. And he actually <laughs> advised Spielberg on he was the advisor on making the movie, and all of the things you see on there. He's actually, um, uh, witnessed, um, oh, sorry, no, he's not witnessed. He's, he's actually interviewed witnesses, um, and he believes that those items were real, and he amalgamated them all into that movie. Quite a good little Easter egg for our listeners. Uh, they'll certainly <laughs> appreciate that one, but I never yeah, yeah. realized that. Yeah, he was the advisor, and he does this cameo appearance right at the end. Because, I mean, uh, Close Encounters obviously references a lot of mm. famous incidents that are unexplained. Is it Flight 19, the torpedo yeah. bombers that disappeared? Yeah. Absolutely. I believe yeah. it. Doesn't it try to portray those airmen being returned as well as part of the people that are coming out of the spaceship at the end? Uh, it, it does, but I, I, you know, I don't know how much of that is actually real, but oh, they do. They, I mean, there's no, but a, it's based a, on a real story. It is, it yeah. is yes, yes. Yeah. As are all the other instances, of course. Yeah. What do you think about the portrayal of ufology in Hollywood? I mean, Close Encounters is the perfect example, perhaps, for us to use in that regard. Do you believe it's, it's respectful? I I have mixed feelings on Hollywood. Um, mm -hmm. In some ways, I think it's part of the uh, drip drip disclosure uh, thing that's going on. Uh, I am disappointed that there's so many uh, nasty stories being portrayed with aliens. Uh, they're they're not all like that. There was one recently where this this craft come down it looked like the sail of a ship i can't remember the name of the movie that uh, was a rival tony well done thank you if i knew if anybody was going to know you two guys would <laughs> well well that is more the sort of thing i think we're likely uh to to experience rather than the world being overrun by 
crawling insects and what have you that want to consume us and, and, and so forth. Because quite frankly, if they wanted to do that, that would have already happened. I have my beliefs in what's going on, which is fair. And I don't mind sharing them, but it's it's quite intense and what have you. And uh, um, But I don't think we're going to be overrun uh, in an army type situation where we're at war with them. I think there are some naughty guys here already and we are already enslaved. But the good guys are here also at the moment. But that's another story. <laughs> so it's it's not necessarily that this all of this we could consider hostile, and it's not necessarily that all of this we could consider benign, but a bit of a mix. I I believe I believe so, and I think that Hollywood is basically run by government. I mean, it's a well-known fact that that Disney, for instance, had really strong ties with the cia and there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of stuff that's come out as well and it's not just hearsay and 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 you know wishful thinking by strange people with tinfoil hats on yeah okay well i mean i I don't really have anything else i want to discuss i don't know if you want to put anything else to tony mark whilst whilst we've got him well thanks very much tony um first and foremost i mean it's been fascinating and uh you know just listening to to your stories and and your theories uh sort of certainly made me want to go to look at the website and uh (laughs) you know investigate further so thank you very much well thank you very much for that well that's the thing it's it's about information i mean it's it's making this information available to discussing it and putting it out there and it 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 is a fascinating subject is whilst we've got you tony is there anything you would like to plug or talk about or promote whilst we we can give you the opportunity to do so well i'd love to just uh, give the website address for people if they want to know more or indeed get on uh, get on board the uh, the website address is www.eaufo.co.uk and on there you can actually find uh, our facebook uh, discussion group and anybody can join in uh, there is a few rules and what have you but uh, it's all fairly simple stuff and um, I'm just pleased that people if they find this interesting uh, if it just tempts them to go onto the website well my job's done I think perhaps a lot of the time it's putting a seed there for somebody because I do tend to waffle on a seed <laughs> for somebody to say ah I want to know more about that then you can go to the website and have a look that's the beauty of the podcasting medium is that mm. you can have the liberty to do that. I mean, like I said, we would have taken 10 minutes from you, Tony. We'd, we'd have taken two hours. It doesn't matter. We, we just appreciate that you've been prepared to take the time to talk to us, to be honest. Yeah, I um, appreciate your re- time too. With regards to that website, that's mm. E-A-U-F-O as one word. Mm-hmm. And that link to the East Anglian UFO website group, I will put into the metadata to this podcast. So if you are listening to this podcast on a smart device, be an iPod Touch, an iPhone, galaxy what whatever you're listening to it on you should be able to follow the link directly through to the website from the metadata in the podcast those of you on an apple device if you access the function which says view full description whilst your device is connected to the internet you should be able to scroll down to the metadata to the podcast and the link will be there for you if you want to follow up tony's website there really i haven't got much more to say um other than like mark said tony thank you very much for your time it's been a fascinating conversation i certainly feel like i've learned a lot of things i wasn't aware of and whilst i wouldn't even pretend to have your level of information i i you know i I, I've, i've i've learned about certain stories over the years i've i've heard of certain stories and it certainly opened up a lot of those stories that i was aware of myself it's been a fascinating conversation tony i appreciate it and I think a lot of our listeners will appreciate it as well. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. And thank you very much, guys, too. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you. Okay, then. Well, bye-bye, Tony. Take care. All right. That's great. I'll talk to you on the emails. Cool. Thank, thank you. you. What a lovely bloke. <laughs> yeah. Hey, careful what you say. I'm still on here. But I'm, trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> it's nice to hear that, actually. But I'm trying to figure out how to turn the thing off. I'm... I'm quite uh, useless at all this stuff oh well, here uh, we go this is the little red button the red yeah. one mate yeah, all right you, you can say off. nice things about me now oh we will thank you <laughs>